Hey, we're launching a Patreon! If you'd like to help support the channel, there's a link in the description below and at the end of the video. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Welcome to the third edition of Good Design, Bad Design, where we look at how games approach UI, UX, and graphic design. Things like menus, UI, camera work, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, the presentation of information. While graphic design and art are tied to each other, a great artist isn't necessarily a great graphic designer. Beautiful games can still have graphic design elements that are cumbersome, ugly, or simply incohesive with their respective games. Great graphic design and presentation is almost never the most important part of a game's success, but it can be the little extra thing that pushes a 9 to a 10. Oh, and one more thing before we start. These examples aren't necessarily paired up, but there are a few parallels you can spot. Let's get to it. Good design. It's time. Persona 5's incredible UI is the inspiration for this series, so it deserves its own segment. Persona 5's UI is an excellent mix of style and functionality. It isn't necessarily a reinvention of anything, instead it's a stylish refinement of the same sort of menu systems used in other games. But the work done is so good. It elevates a very good JRPG into something astounding. When there are people cosplaying as your menus, you've done something right. P5's UI stands out partially because of how well it's tied to the game's major themes. Persona 5 is about thieves, willpower, and rebellion. It's full of visual motifs to match those themes. The ransom lettering used in the main menu headers, graffiti, CG animations of Joker swinging around between menus, and aggressive motion graphics with tons of thick and angular shapes. The menu layouts creatively break many conventional graphic design rules without looking ugly or compromising functionality. Individual words and letters in the headers and subheaders of the type are cohesively incohesive in design, with a varying baseline, type size, and deliberate misalignments. Breaking typographic rules like this can be really easy to mess up, but Masayoshi Suto, his team, and the localization team pull it off seamlessly. The combat UI is stylish too, and it makes the combat more engrossing. Every option in P5 can be reached by a single button, which lets battles flow smoothly, much better than most traditional JRPG menus where you're scrolling and picking everything. The countless motion graphic and character animations that play as you go through your options makes selecting your next move feel more visceral and satisfying. The offset red silhouette that surrounds your characters is a brilliant way to highlight your character and connect it with the framing of the battle UI. Even if the novelty of these animations wears off, the spectacle doesn't get in the way, distract, or slow down the action. P5's design is both high quality and high quantity. It goes above and beyond what it had to do. While not every game should be this upfront with its UI, Persona 5's graphic design is a selling point and the game wouldn't be as memorable without it. Bad Design There was a time that I felt that Sonic Chronicles was a good game. I no longer feel that Sonic Chronicles is a good game. It's a barely passable intro to JRPGs, but really it's a boring slog. But we're not here for a full review, I just want to dunk on the presentation. Because it's unfinished. The hand-drawn environments are nicely rendered, but they feel so bad to explore. They make the rough 3D models on top of them look way worse. These bad flash animation motion comic cutscenes, some character portraits seem like they were designed for a different game, the portrait outlines are inconsistent with some portraits randomly using a different outline color, or just straight up not having one. The game is built for touchscreens, but the buttons are tiny for some reason. Special moves use action commands that are basically a poor man's elite beat agents. There's no juiciness to the execution either, which makes them unsatisfying to hit on time. These eyes! These eyes! What's with these eyes? The presentation's rough. Yes, the game's on the DS, but that doesn't mean it can't be better. Hotel Dusk, The World Ends With You, Feel The Magic, Elite Beat Agents, these games have solid presentations despite the limitations. Well, 
at least Sonic Chronicles looks the way it sounds. Good design. As much as I like the flash of games like P5, I also love minimalistic UI design. The more a game can strip away, the easier it can be to focus on what matters. If the game is still great and easy to understand when there's nothing left to cut, you know it's built on a fantastic foundation. Mini Metro is a game born from minimalism. In Mini Metro, you manage a series of metro stations through an interface inspired by Harry Beck's London Underground tube map. You route out a number of colored transit lines across stations represented by basic shapes. These stations will slowly appear over time as either triangles, squares, or circles, or rare stations with unusual shapes like crosses, stars, or wedges. As time ticks away, customers appear as tiny shapes and try to travel to their matching station through your train lines. Leave too many people waiting for a train and it's game over. The challenge of Mini Metro is keeping your transit lines running efficiently for as long as possible with the limited amount of trains, transit lines, and tunnels you have to work with. Mini Metro is brilliant at conveying a lot of information in a chaotic, time-sensitive game while keeping a minimalistic design. Key information is easy to spot yet subtle like how the game displays the overcrowding mechanic. A misaligned customer represents the station's capacity limit. Any extra shapes will impatiently bounce around as a radial time limit starts to fill up. The music is soft ambient tones and very subtle alert sounds that warm without distracting. The iconography and typography here is as clean as it gets, and the framing always flows smoothly. The game never once cuts between the menus and gameplay. Instead, it uses an assortment of pans, blurs, and zooms for its transitions. There aren't any jarring scene changes within the game either. There's a constant, barely noticeable zoom as you play, slowly revealing more and more of the map where new stations may appear. Without noticing it, the tiny corner you started in slowly evolves into a vast network. Mini Metro's UI needs to be simple so things don't become too overwhelming as it gets more hectic as you gain new train lines and stations. Its beautiful and recognizable aesthetic helps players focus on what matters. It's a high-speed management puzzle game stripped down to its essential core. Bad design. Functional UI is important, but it's really a bare minimum. Better are cohesive UIs, ones that feel like they belong only in their game. Mortal Kombat X is totally solid as a game, but its interface doesn't match with its identity. In their recent games, NetherRealm Studios uses a minimalist design. It's full of elegant white graphics and serif typefaces to create a clean and sleek design, and it's not bad. It's not a fundamentals problem, just a stylistic one. The HUD during fights functions well and keeps things focused on the action, but for a game whose brand is over-the-top violence, a reserved UI comes across as a little bland, and is a mismatch in the context of Mortal Kombat. It saps the game's adrenaline a little bit, both for players and for people watching at home. The character select menu has two rows of portraits where everyone looks straight at the camera with a default facial expression. It says school picture day, not death tournament. No special framing, no visual motif, just character models showing up top. The main menu is functional, but looks like two ideas were merged one based around panels, and another based around a simple column of options. Like they couldn't decide on one, so they used both. The panels show the Faction War mode, DLC, and the Living Towers mode, with the DLC store front row center. Gross. Especially if you just bought the game. It's weird that the other two panel options have their own spot. Faction War and Living Towers feel like they belong in other submenus, but then the DLC store would be on its own. Maybe that's worse. Some of the menu options are hard to read as the white serif type treatments blend into the background, even with the dark gradient. There are other problems in the typeface, like in the fighter card menu which houses one of my typographic pet peeves. Dark text on a dark background. Dun dun dun! Don't do this. Just don't. It doesn't read well. These are minor issues, definitely not deal breakers, but they do add up. Minimalism can be a great design tool, but in this case it just doesn't mesh with what MK represents. 
MK9 does this a million times better. Here, get some! Good design. Nier Automata might have the strongest implementation of Diageg UI I've ever seen. It's not just that it's a part of the game world. The UI is weaved into Nier's narrative and elevates the experience to something that could only be told effectively as a game. Designed by Platinum's Hisayoshi Kojima under Yokotaro's direction, Automata's UI on its surface is put together quite well. Both the main menu and in-game UI use a monochromatic beige color scheme, that contrasts well against the browns and grays of most of Nier's environments. This color palette is a key part of Automata's visual identity and matches tonally with the game and its characters, the emotionally suppressive Yorha units. The layout and type treatment are cold and systematic, but the beige colors make the UI surprisingly warm to look at. An additional red-orange highlights either critical information like new menu items or various threats like damage within the life bar. This color scheme also matches the hacking minigame to, as Kojima states in his developer's blog, give the game a unified visual identity. The color scheme created some design challenges. The use of other colors was very restricted. In order to convey information like stat changes within weapons, Kojima had to rely on other things like transparency and thickness in the type. Small touches like a transparent grid texture and shading near the edges go a long way to make the menu feel less abstract and more physical. The UI is very solid, but that's not the amazing part. Nier Automata is one of the few games that use UI as a core storytelling component. The menu isn't just an abstract interface that's exclusively there for the player. It is the literal OS for your characters, 2B and 9S. The settings, equipment, abilities, data log, and more are tied to how your characters function in universe, not as a breaking of the fourth wall. Ma'am, are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, hello? Go ahead and adjust your settings so you can hear me, alright? My favorite part of Nier's diegetic approach is just how customizable it is. Every UI element is treated as a chip. Similar to the AP system in Kingdom Hearts, the player is given a limited amount of space for equipping color-coded chips that grant abilities, boost stats, or more uniquely, display UI elements. Health bars, experience bars, mini-maps, markers, cooldown indicators, enemy health and level displays, each of these can be toggled at the player's preference. Giving up these UI elements to open up space for other chips gives Automata an unusual avenue to play with risk versus reward. It also ties the UI to the world and bridges the gap between the player and the character. When characters are hurt or hit with an EMP blast, their health bars freak out, enemies get mosaiced out, Visual filters are applied to overwhelm and confuse your senses. Some status effects disable your UI's functionality. Nier's UI goes beyond just being a useful interface and is used to great effect in its narrative. And without spoiling anything, it adds an extra punch to key moments that couldn't have been done in any other type of media. Nier shows just how much untapped potential there is in the interaction between storytelling and UI. Bad design. Fable 3 is... ambitious? Let's go with ambitious. It's a Peter Molyneux game, so it comes with the territory, but it's especially true with Fable 3's menu design. Unlike its predecessors, Fable 3's interface is diegetic. There isn't a traditional menu for managing your character and inventory, not even a simple pause menu, save for story events. Instead, when you hit the start button, your character is magically teleported to a small, in-universe hub area, the Sanctuary. This is where all inventory management is handled, and it feels pointless and terrible. The Sanctuary is unnecessary and breaks the game's flow. Having to walk around a hub for item management accomplishes nothing that a traditional menu couldn't have done more effectively. It doesn't make the game more immersive either. It's jarring to have this weird pocket dimension that you can just teleport to at any time. Some games, like a lot of Zeldas, handle in-universe menus just fine, but you don't usually see it for a main menu. The main menu is just used too frequently, so this approach turns the menu from something quirky to something tedious. It's an extra step that could have been resolved with a normal menu, like in Fable 2. Now don't get me wrong, Fable 2's menu is no prize either, but at least you could still navigate it. 
Some of the better diegetic menus like Near or Dead Space still work as more traditional menus. Fable 3 tried to be cute and took the idea a bit too far, and because of their effort, you can now get trapped in the pause menu! The Sanctuary isn't the only problem. Fable 3's UI is bad across the board. There's no simple minimap to help you get your bearings, the infamous sparkling trail only works some of the time, the shop menus are ugly with awkward empty space and poorly displayed items, most interactions require you to hold the input which both feels and looks clunky, the minigames, You'll have to pay for that. and the road to rule is an overly elaborate skill tree that wastes your time by having you run across and slowly open chests for perks. Fable 3's UI is an ambitious concept, but it's fundamentally flawed and is only made worse by a poor execution. Where Nier Automata's diegetic interface is deeply tied to its core and greatly enhances both the game and story, Fable 3's Sanctuary is clunky and ultimately adds nothing. It seems as if it was made just for the sake of it. And while it's admirable to try something new, the most successful new ideas are not only ambitious, but purposeful. Aim? for both.